Hello, 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 and people welcome on here. Thank you, everyone, for All right. joining us. How are you doing, sir? How are you doing? Today, I'm doing really well. I'm you're doing very well. Thank you for joining me. Today, I have Dr. Um, Joanne Breidenbaum. I hope I pronounced it right, from Liberty University. Yeah. And we are actually going to talk about evangelism, what is not, and how to share Christ without fear. So please take your time and educate us on everything that we need to know for today, for our generation, for our churches, for our community, and how we can be better Christians. So I would like you to introduce yourself. Um, I've known the doctor for just about maybe under a year at Liberty University, and he did a great job teaching me on evangelism and how to share Christ without fear. So if you don't mind, um, please, take, please take the wheel. All right. Well, thank you, Abina. I am Joel Breidenbaugh. Uh, I have been teaching at Liberty for a little over 11 years, and uh, I teach both in the preaching department as well as the evangelism courses, uh, both at the graduate level for master's and then also some uh, DMIN students uh, in preaching. Uh, but uh, it's, it's a joy of mine. I also pastor church, Gospel Center Church in the Orlando, Florida area. Okay. And uh, just uh, thankful to be here with you. And uh, some things I've put into practice myself and some things I've, I've shared from others and learned from others to try to share with students to help them become better witnesses and disciples of right. Jesus Christ. That's right. Thank yeah. you so much. And uh, kind regards to your family. And I'm sure you're watching with us right you. now too. And thank you so much for taking your precious time on this weekend to share this with us. But so we'll get right into it. I had a few questions that I had lined up, but you had your own um, layout as well. And the first questions that I had um, was, what is evangelism or what is it not? Is it a commandment or is it something that we can decide not to do? Yeah, that's a great question. So evangelism is a command given by the Lord Jesus Christ and, and God's word uh, telling us to share the good news. The gospel means good news, to share the good news of who Jesus is and why he came so that other people might receive that message, believe that message, and be saved. Uh, and it's that message, uh, it, there's four, what I call four key components to that message that ought to be shared every time we talk about Jesus, uh, if we want to give a full picture of the gospel. And I always like to start kind of at the beginning, talk about God, that, that God exists. The Bible makes that very clear. He's the creator. Yeah. And one one characteristic that differentiates him from everyone else is that he is holy. Amen. Uh, the, the, Bible, the Bible says God's a God of love, the God, God's a God of grace, a God of mercy, a God of kindness, and the list goes on. But nowhere except holiness does the Bible say, mm. holy, holy, holy mm. is the Lord of hosts. Mm. It says that in Isaiah chapter 6 and Revelation chapter 4. And for the Hebrew, who the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, when when they were going to use a superlative, we would use a superlative in English like great, greater, greatest. Greatest is a superlative. For a Hebrew, you would say something twice. Holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. And the fact that it, holy, holy, holy is said three times is a super, super superlative. Okay. So it's a redundancy. It means he's the most holy God or is he's, or we would say most holy or holiest. Literally, the Hebrew is saying he's the most holiest. Wow. That's bad English, but it's good. Hebrew. Yeah. And it teaches us a key characteristic about God. And because he's holy, he's separate from us who are sinners. Ever since uh, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3 sinned, uh, we've inherited that sin nature. We've had sin imputed to us, Romans chapter 5 teaches. Wow. And our sin separates from God. But when I'm drawing pictures, sometimes I'll, I'll use a sheet of paper. And on one corner, I'll write the word God. And maybe I'll put a star around him like he's in glory or in holiness. And then in the bottom corner, just as far away from God as I can get, I, I draw a stick figure man. And uh, sometimes I'll even darken him in to show that we're, we're lost in our sin. We're separated from God. It's that big chasm. Sometimes you see the, the picture of the two cliffs and God's on one side and man's on the other trying to get to him and, and he can't. But it's the idea we're separated from God. And then God sends Jesus Christ who took on human flesh, uh, walked in our shoes, was tempted, the Bible says in Hebrews, as in every way that we are, yet without sin. So he never succumbed to that temptation. That's right. And 
he was able he was able then to die on a cross in our place, the sinless one dying in the place of sinners, and God placed on him the sin of the world. It says, Behold, in John chapter one, yeah. behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so in the picture, I would draw God on one corner, man in the bottom corner, I put Jesus Christ right in the middle, draw a cross, and show that he has come to be the only answer we have for our sin problem. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I, I'm encounter, I encounter people who say, well, Joel, don't you, don't you think God really has more than one way? Are, are you going to be so close-minded as to think that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven? Oh, yeah. And I say, listen, if God had other ways to get there, let's say he had five other ways to get there. Why would he, why would he come up with a sixth way that would require his son's life? True. Sure. No, nah, he would say, no, choose one of the five. But there's no other way to get there except through Jesus Christ. And that, then suddenly the, the crucifixion of the Son of God makes sense. And, of course, he rose from the dead to prove that he's Lord of all. He's the long-awaited Messiah, the deliverer from sin that God had promised. And the, so the three parts, God in his holiness, man in his sinfulness, Christ in his holiness, dying in the place of our sin. And then the fourth part is our response to the gospel. I like to talk mm. about a twofold response. Um, some, some scholars like to talk about a threefold response, but the response is repentance and faith. It's two sides of the same coin. Some talk mm. about surrendering your life as well. I think repentance goes along with surrender, but, um, it, the Bible is very clear. We must believe in Jesus. And that's not just a head knowledge. That's a life commitment kind of word. It means you have to believe certain things about him, but you have to commit your life to him. That's, it's one thing for me to get in a plane and I hope to do this one day and go up to 13,000 feet and jump out of that plane and skydive. I, I, that, that's one of my bucket list things to do. <laughs> but I would never do that without a parachute. Why? Because I trust the parachute's going to do its job. Correct. After I free fall from a few thousand feet, I'm going to pull that cord, and, 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 and that's what people do. They trust the parachute would do its job. No one jumps out of a plane without a parachute. Well, there's certain things you believe about that parachute, and it's one thing you say, I believe that could happen. But it's another thing to say, okay, I'm going to put it to the test. It's another thing for you to say, I'm going to commit my life to Jesus Christ. That's right. And you do that by trusting in him, and you do that by turning from your sin. That's what repentance is. It's turning from that sin. And uh, it's an area of, of, of Christianity I think it's overlooked a lot today. There's not enough people preaching repentance from That's sin true. Uh, to trust in Jesus. We see that in Matthew chapter 3, verse 2. John the Baptist said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Chapter 4, verse 17, Jesus says the exact same thing. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Mm-hmm. We see Peter preaching that message in Acts three nineteen, When there's a, a lame man that's been strengthened, he says it's by, Je- by the power of Jesus. But he says, you're called to repent for the kingdom, you know, repent and, 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 and believe. Yeah. Uh, we see Paul talk about it in Acts 17, verse 30. It says uh, God is calling all men everywhere to repent. He preaches in Athens. And he writes about that in Romans 2, 4 and 2 Timothy 2, 25. And all throughout we see repentance from sin and believing in Jesus. Two sides of the same coin. So a true faith is a repentant faith. Mm. A true repentance is a believing repentance. And, and when you repent, you repent from your sin to trust in Jesus as Lord. There are some that teach that you can trust in Jesus as Savior without trusting him as Lord. And yet I don't think they've thought through biblically what that means. Because Jesus is our Savior. I'm not denying that at yeah. all. He's called Savior something like nine times in the New Testament. Wow. He's called Lord over 200 times in the New Testament. He's the Lord who is our Savior. Wow. And, and the Bible says in Romans 10, 9, whoever confesses with their mouth that Jesus Isn't is it? Lord yeah. and believe in their heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So there's something you have to believe and it's in your heart. It's a commitment. But you have to confess him as Lord. You don't get to confess him as Savior and come to him Lord later on. You, you come to him to begin with wow. as Lord. So that's kind of the heart of the gospel, the, the four key aspects, the, the holiness of God, the sinfulness of man, the, the holiness of Christ who died for sinners, and then our response of repentance and faith. And uh, I'll sometimes draw that picture out and show. And, and, and one thing I also add when Christ is in the middle of the cross and the, the man in sin down in the corner is I'll draw these arrows, one going to the cross and one from the cross going to the man. And our sin, all our darkness, uh-huh. is transferred to Jesus Christ. Sure. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he who knew no sin, God made him who knew no sin to be sin, that in him we might become the righteous of God. How does that righteousness come? How does his white holiness, in that sense, purity, how is that transferred to our account? Mm. It's when we believe in him 
turn from our sin. So he becomes darkened yeah. in sin. And then that stick figure man is no longer darkened, but become becomes light in, in the sense yeah. of, of cleansed from that wow. sin. Uh, and, and shows sh- kind of show that picture that what, what theologians call the double imputation. It's the double transfer. Mm. Our sin and our guilt on Jesus, his righteousness, obedience transferred to us. Yeah. And that's the best deal we could ever make Excellent. in the whole world. Excellent. So basically, the evangelism is a commandment. Every Christian cannot uh, be a true Christian or follower of Christ without preaching the gospel of salvation. Because that's what Christ did when he came here on earth. So you were saying basically with all... Go ahead. Yeah. So I would say, um, like any command, uh, a Christian at times disobeys. I mean, we, we, we disobey commands all the time. Sometimes there are commands to do something, pray without ceasing. First Thessalonians 5.17. Rejoice always. All right, in all things, give thanks. I mean, there's certain things that we say, well, I didn't give thanks. I didn't pray unceasingly. So there's certain things we fall short of all the time. And there's certain things we're called not to right. do. Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal. So there's certain things we're commanded not to do. There's certain things we're commanded to do. And evangelism we're called to do. And sometimes we fail at that. I messed up on an opportunity just yesterday. I had an opportunity to tell someone about Jesus and I walked away from there saying, oh, doggone it, I missed that opportunity. And, uh, and I took an opportunity later in the day to talk to someone else about Jesus, but there's still times we miss it. And there's times professors and pastors and preachers miss opportunities and we beat ourselves up and say, oh, why, why, wouldn't I, why wouldn't I more attune to what God was trying to do there? Um, and so obviously anytime we, we fail to do that, we disobey, obviously that displeases the Lord. We, that's why we're called to a life of repentance. Lord, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I failed again. Help, help me, help me be more attuned next, next time, time to share your message. Um, and, and, and so just like that, God can forgive us, Yes. but we as Christians have a strong responsibility to obey the Lord in all areas of life. He is our Lord. He's the boss. We're not. So he gets to tell us, Hey, tell someone about Jesus, you know, give to the Lord's work and all these sorts of commands. Um, so we're commanded to, and when we don't do that, we're disobeying, disobeying the Lord. So we, we do need to share our faith. Our faith. Now, you know, we, and we had a, a, a book that we, we studied in sharing Christ without fear. In the first chapter, it talked about, um, you cannot fail. Um, and I just want you to elaborate on that because most of us, um, the thought of evangelism, like we just, we just, we just crunch. We're just afraid of being rejected. We're afraid of not knowing what to say. And we're thinking maybe it's, it's, it's just a job for a sect, you know, some particular type of people. Maybe it's the pastor's job or the pastors are thinking it's the congregation's job to do it. But would you be able to tell us what that statement meant? Because when I read it, it blessed me. You know, you can yeah. fail in evangelism. Yeah, so when uh, the author talked, uh, you cannot fail in evangelism. The idea is if you share the gospel, you can't fail. Sometimes, sometimes we share an incomplete gospel yeah. and we don't, we don't get a chance to tell the whole story. Maybe we focus on sin and Christ's provision and so forth. Um, or we talk about believing in Jesus. We fail to emphasize repentance. I do think, you know, we, we need to do a better job of that. But the idea of not failing is every chance we get, we ought to be seeking to plant seeds of the gospel. Right. Uh, that's what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians. He says, I planted, Apollos watered, and God brought the increase. Mm-hmm. And so if God uses uh, me and, or, and, and, and someone else, someone plants a seed, or I plant a seed, someone else waters it, God brings the increase when he sees fit. Sometimes that's through my ministry. Sometimes that's through someone else's ministry. I shouldn't be upset at that. I should be thankful that God is doing his work to work through his people to bring more people into his family and into the kingdom. And so anytime you witness, even when it's not as much of a witness as you'd like to give, uh, you really, because you're planting a seed of the gospel, seed of hope, you're not failing. Mm. One of the things uh, my family and I do when we go out to eat in restaurants uh, is we try to ask a waiter or a waitress uh, as they've taken our order and they're starting to bring us drinks or something, we'll say, hey, you know, in just a few moments, and I, I learned this from somebody else, but I uh, said, in just a few moments, we're going to thank the Lord for our food. Is there anything we could pray for in your life? And what we've done right there is we said, oh. when we believe in the Lord and we believe he hears our prayers. Now we haven't given a full gospel witness to yes. say this, is what Jesus has done for sin before. Although sometimes the Perfect. door opens for that. And that response, sometimes we hear people say, no, nah, I'm really good. And a lot of times they say, wow, that, that means a lot. And they'll talk about their family or a friend that's going through a hard time or themselves going through a hard time. 
but we've had some breakdown in tears right. over the years and say, I never had anyone stop to show that they actually cared. I just work here and people want me to bring their food and they don't care. And you know, there's a lot of hurting people out there. And if, if one of the things we can do as Christians is just to say, Hey, as representatives of Jesus, we're his hands and his feet. We're an extension of his body. If we can just let you know that we care and we, we have compassion toward you and, and, and we can, we, if we can minister to you in some way, we'd like to do that. Um, sometimes that goes a long way in people's lives because it, again, it's just it froze up there just a second. I think I had a call coming uh, through. I declined that, nope. but, uh, sometimes it's just planting that seed. And, uh, I, I think that's what God calls to do and then we can't fail. Yeah. So I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Can you hear me? I okay, can hear you good. now. The essential thing is to share it, just plant a seed. So being successful in evangelism does not mean that the person must definitely come to Christ the first time that you plant that seed. The, the fact that you've planted the seed is to, to us or to Christ is success. That's why this, I think the subject was saying you cannot fail because you must plant a seed, right? So the person might accept Christ uh, or the person might not accept Christ when you share your faith with them, but at least you've been successful because you did, you obeyed the commandment. And I thought that was reassuring to me. Like it was a blessing. Yeah. And so, yeah. And, and there's a study that came out a few years ago that said, uh, and I don't remember if Will McRaney came out with this study or someone else, but came out and said, uh, the, the average person that comes to Christ based on all that they can remember has heard the gospel seven times before they responded. Wow. Seven times. So when you share and you plant a seed of hope, that may be the first time. Okay. That may be the fifth time. That's right. Maybe the 10th time. Yeah. But the point is God uses that to begin to draw people toward him. And when we stand before God one day, I don't think he's going to say, Hey, how many people did you win to follow Jesus? I think he's going to say, how faithful were you in planting seeds of hope and encouraging others to, to, to come after Jesus? I think he's going to look more for faithfulness mm. than successfulness. And sometimes we get confused in that in the world because the world, we see success in the world and the secular world and businesses getting bigger and making more money and, and planting, uh, starting new plants and so forth. And for Christianity, sometimes we see churches do that, but most churches don't. But the question is, are you being faithful? And I think that's what God's going to be looking for. Wow. That's so, I mean, that blessed me when I got to know, because, um, again, we are just crunched with fear. So how would you, how would you advise one to, you know, take this very, as an enjoyable exercise in our faith? where you, you know, you're just free to share Christ without the fear of rejection. How would you say one should prepare for that for an everyday life? Yeah, I think it starts with prayer and asking the Lord to say, Lord, I'm, I'm a vessel. I'm your servant. Just use me as you see fit. And uh, Lord, I may not be that outgoing and, and I'm not that outgoing. I actually, I'm, I'm a perfect blend of my parents' uh, DNA. And my dad is one of the quietest people you'll ever meet. My mom is one of the friendliest people you'll ever meet. She never meets a stranger. She can talk to anybody. And uh, my dad, he'll talk back when people talk with him, but he's just not outgoing. And I'm kind of in the middle. Oh. So there's times I have an outgoing side of me, and there's times I have a very reserved part of me. So I'm kind of right down the middle. I'm not the most outgoing people person you'll ever meet. But I know some guys that are. And it's easy for them. But I also know some people that are very much reserved. My dad's one of those, as I mentioned. And yet I see my dad come alive when he gets to tell someone about Jesus. Mm. He loves going and I've seen him for decades go around and uh, follow up with someone that's visited the church or maybe even go out on a, on a, on a canvas and try to take a whole neighborhood and share, share the hope of Jesus and, and maybe get the Jesus video into their homes. And he just comes alive when he gets a chance to tell someone about Jesus. But that all started because it never came easy for him. It all started with him praying, saying, Lord, use me. I'm your servant. Uh, speaking doesn't come easy for me, but help me take that step. That's right. And I'll say this, even when I first started telling people about Jesus back when I was a teenager, over 25 years ago now, that um, it was hard. And there's times it's still hard in certain s scenarios, but it's easier now the more you practice it That's right. than it is the way. It is. So the more you do it, the more you get used to it. It's kind of like anything in life. You, if you're learning to cook, the more you cook, the, the better, the more confident you are in cooking. If you're a, a sports person, the more you play a sport, the more confident you get in it. That's, that's the way it is with sharing your faith. Thank you for that answer. 
Um, I don't know if there's anything more. Um, I have a few things to ask. Uh, the book also talked about um, the five share Jesus questions. Like you meet someone on the street mm -hmm. or you have, you know, a family member that is not saved and you've been, you know, it's, it's been a burden on your heart to really um, try and win them over. And then they, you, you've set an appointment just to have some fellowship with them. So now you've grabbed their attention. So you might have the time to go through some of Jesus questions. Would you be able to talk us through, or I can go through it or however you want to handle it, but what are some of the questions that you want to ask this person to engage intensely in that, in that conversation? Yeah, so as much as I like the, the uh, share Jesus questions, and there's five of those, yeah. I have found over time, and that's a helpful book, and I highly recommend it. But there's there's one key question I learned from another pastor years ago, okay. and I think it summarizes all those other questions up okay. in one question and gets to the heart of the matter. Um, and so I, I've asked this question literally thousands of times um, over the years. I used to record uh, the first probably seven or 800 responses. I record them on, on a sheet of paper and mm. checked off in a column while people response were and I did that for years and finally just I set that aside because I I got a pretty good a pretty good understanding what they would respond okay and here's the one question I use the one question I use is in your personal opinion what do you understand it takes for a person to go to heaven um out of out of that asking that question probably two or three thousand times I've only had I think two people say oh I'm not going to heaven I'm going to hell uh, almost everybody else assumes they're going to heaven or they'll go on to say they don't believe in heaven, but very few people say that. Most people think they're going to heaven. And because I'm asking them in their personal opinion, what do you understand it takes for a person to go to heaven? Uh, they feel more free to respond. Right. And I've, I've jotted down responses. I've, I've found here in America, in the places I've asked that question, 50% of the time they respond with faith in Jesus or something about believing that Jesus died for your sins along those lines. So about 50% about of the people I encounter out there have a Christian belief. Now, some of them know it in their head, but they haven't committed their life to him. But about 50% of them know the right answer. The other 50% don't. They respond with some sort of works. Well, if you pray enough, mm. uh, if you're a good person, if you keep the Ten Commandments, mm. uh, if you go to church, mm. if you get baptized. I mean, I hear, and it's just work, 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 where there's so many of those. And so 50% of the people out there don't know the right answer. And when those kind of people respond, if, if, if they respond with the correct answer, I said, praise God, you've, you, you, you obviously know the, the gospel, the good news. Yeah. And then I'll say something like, do you have a church home you fat and things like that? But for the other people, I'll say, we well, you know that's not a bad answer. I said, there's a lot of people with that kind of answer. Mm -hmm. I said, do you care if I take just a few seconds and summarize what God's word says about that? Wow. And this, that's the second question I ask. It's a follow-up question. And I would say 90 to 95% of the people say, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in knowing. Uh, there's a few people say, no, I don't have time. Or, I don't really want to hear it kind of thing. But the m vast majority of the people say, yeah, I'm interested to hear. And I'll simply talk then about the holiness of God, the sinfulness of man, how Jesus is the only answer, and how we have to respond with repentance from sin and faith in Jesus. Wow. Uh, and I'll do that probably, summarize all that up in about 60, 60 to 90 seconds <laughs> and just kind of connect the dots for them. Ask them if they want to know more and, invite them to a church and things like that. But um, that's, I have found those two questions get me further than sometimes if I said I have five questions, some people turn that off and say, I'm not sure I want to answer five, right. you know, but I've never had anyone say no to say, I say, and I say this to people, I say, you know, in my line of work, I, they don't even know what I do. I say in my line of work, I ask a survey question. Can I ask it of you? I've asked that literally thousands of times and no one's ever told me no. When I tell them I have one question to ask them. Okay. So I don't know for five questions for one question they never say no never say and i get a chance to find out that i'm sorry that, that's very good so for those watching and again for those watching if you don't mind you can share the video we all just want to learn and so we're talking to dr joel right now about sharing christ without fear so to add just take the principle of what dr joel has said about how he the questions that he asks and then the other five that if you want to add to what he's added is do you have any kind of spiritual beliefs is the kind of first question you can ask someone 
that you're trying to bring over to the kingdom of God. And the second question is to you, who do you think Jesus Christ is? Um, the third question you could ask is, do you think there is a heaven or a hell, which relates to your question? And then the fourth is, if you died, do you think that you make it to heaven or to hell? Again, that relates to your question, because if they don't know what heaven is or where hell is, um, or some of them know where they're going, like you said. And then the final question is, um, if what you're believing is not true, assuming they don't believe in Christ. So you ask them, if what you're believing is not true, do you want to know the truth? Do you, do you want to know if, if is what you believe in is actually true or not? So this is great. And I think that our community needs it. My generation needs it. My, my nation needs it. Everyone needs the, the message of Christ. Because at the end of the day, we, are, we all want to make a rapture. I mean, that, that's where my vision is. <laughs> that's where my goal is. I'm, I, I'm not planning on being here um, in that tribulation time. No. So um, as many people as we can take with us uh, doing the work of an evangelist, I think that will be a blessing to the Christian kingdom. So are there yeah. any scriptures that you can share with us? I know that there were like seven that were mentioned in, in, the, in, the, in the book. Are there any other scriptures you can share with us so that those watching... Uh, we'll be able to jot it down or, you know, just, just, just use that as, as an equipment for them. Yeah. So the verses I like to use um, related to the gospel and the four aspects of the holiness of God, the sinfulness of man, uh, the provisions of Jesus Christ, and then our response to repentance and faith, the kinds of scriptures I like to point out, Isaiah 6, I believe it's verse 3. Okay. Uh, and it talks about holy, holy is, is the Lord of hosts. Yes. Uh, Isaiah 6, then Revelation 4, 8, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Um, so I, I talk about those two verses on the holiness of God. Uh, and sometimes I you know, talk about his existence. I might mention Psalm 19, 1, the heavens declare the glory of God. Yes. And the skies proclaim his handiwork. Um, so I'll, I'll mention those. When I talk about the sinfulness of man, I often, very common verses, something like Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned right. and fall short of the glory of God. Uh, and the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. Yes. When I talk about Christ, uh, I, I often will talk about like 1 Peter 2, 22. Uh, in him was oh. no deceit or no sin. You know, he, ne he never did once sin. I'll talk about uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, that God made right. him who knew no sin to be sin, that we might become, uh, in him we might become the righteous of God. And then uh, and then as far as repentance and, and faith, I, I'll often talk about, Acts 17.30, Paul telling the Athenians that God commands all men everywhere to repent. Uh, and then faith uh, is the idea of uh, confessing Jesus as Lord and believing in your heart, Romans 10, 9, and 10. Um, I'll sometimes throw in 1 John 1, 9, says if, uh, uh, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's part of the, that's part of the response that we need to have. So those are some key verses I've used many times over in my sharing of the gospel. Thank you. So of course you would, you would suggest that we take the Bible with us as, as our, as a weapon to refer to the scriptures. Not. Yeah. Yeah. So whether you have a hard copy in your hand and I for years carried around a little small one because I found out when I carried a big one, <laughs> uh, I pastored, I, I pastored in a community. It was a country community, a few homes, together in a dying community, but they were all kind of scattered out just a yeah. couple miles here and there. And I could go down roads different ways. If I carried a big Bible with me and knocked on someone's door and they let you, they didn't care about you coming to their door. It was, it was one of kind of a country community. I'm going back 15, 20 years now. Um, they would immediately, their eyes, when they saw me at the door, they'd look down and see what was in my hand and they'd see, they'd see the Bible and it would, it would they would change their attitude would change. So then I started carrying a little small Bible that almost fit and hid in my hand and they never broke eye contact with me. They didn't realize I was holding a Bible. And I found that there was ways in which I could get farther into the conversation with them before they were already put a defense up right. because they saw a big Bible. And nowadays with uh, smartphones and the fact that you can have a Bible app on your phone, I typically have it on. Everybody carries a phone, so they don't think they know. And I pull my phone out and I bring up the Bible app and I show them. So, oh, okay. They didn't even realize I <laughs> even had a Bible on me. So, yeah, whether you have a hard copy. Uh -huh. Or your smartphone app, I think either can be very helpful. On uh, big, uh, big Bibles, I did find to be a distraction where people would sometimes set up a defense, unless you're going to talk with them and they are, and you've already started a spiritual conversation, and they say, you know, I am interested in knowing more. Then I think you're okay bringing whatever size Bible you want. 
But if you're trying to plant that seed for the first time, uh, I, I would say a smaller Bible or uh, or a, an app on your phone. Okay, that is great. Now, the other, um, I think it's a miscon misconception that we have. Uh, we, I just want to be careful with my words, but um, why do some pastors think that the work of evangelists is just for the congregation? Yeah, unfortunately, there's some pastors out there that um, they either want to care for the church in, in shepherding or feed them through preaching and teaching. And they put so much focus on that part that they uh, they sort of excuse themselves from the role of, of evangelism. Right. And yet Paul said to Timothy, who was a pastor in Second Timothy chapter four, he said in verse five, do the work of an evangelist. An evangelist goes and shares the gospel. And so I believe pastors ought to be models and examples for that for their people. Um, and, but at the same time, that doesn't mean the congregation now it, that I do it instead of the congregation. Right. I, I, I teach them how to do it. And I set an example before them. And that's something I think the best pastors out there are constantly challenging their people to share their, share the gospel in different ways. Uh, I used to think, and, and I've had to have a, a different look at this in recent years. I used to think, well, if I share stories from the pulpit about me sharing the gospel, that sounds like I'm bragging and I don't, I don't want to bring attention to myself. I want to put attention on Jesus. And so I try not to share those stories. And what I found out was if I wasn't telling those stories, the people made assumptions that, hey, he's not sharing his faith. And I try to do that every week. I mean, if I'm out and about every day, I try to do it, but especially every week. And so I found out, you know, there are ways you can share the gospel and just don't make myself the hero in it. You know, if someone does come to faith, it's, it's all God's glory, not mine. Right. And just talk about saying, if, if I can do this and, and I'm not the most outgoing guy by any stretch of the imagination, then, then you can do it. And you can do it with your friends, just like I try to do it with my friends. So um, I do think pastors have to set that standard as an example. And then they also have to call their people to say, hey, you're not excused. We're all called as Christians to share the hope of Jesus. Okay. Do you think that is being um, is like a subject or a series that is being taught at church often? I, I feel that um, it's not... Mm. It, it's not preached enough. It's not taught enough in the, from the pulpit. That's my my opinion to it. I might be told to be wrong, or someone might view it differently. But you know that would equip us as the congregation to be confident enough to actually do that. What what is your thought about it? From the pulpit. Yeah, I would say you're probably something that it's not taught from the pulpits as much as it needs to be. I know I've taught taught it several times from the pulpit, but not as much as it needs to be. I'm constantly being reminded as I'm in my study and preparation, okay, show another way or use an illustration of ways in which people can share the gospel. And I also want to uh, give a uh, fair view toward both sides of the Great Commission. The Great Commission is evangelizing and discipling. So sometimes, and I'm gifted more discipling, so I got to be careful. I don't just focus on discipling because I'm also called to be an evangelist and to right. help people be evangelists. And so I, sometimes I do want to say, okay, here's ways in which you can grow. Here's ways in which you can help others grow. But I've also got to be more faithful in telling people, okay, here's, here's ways in which you can tell others about Jesus. And I think by and large across, across America that pastors have to do a better job. Now there's a few doing a great job in that and they're seeing their churches grow and they're seeing their people bring their friends to Christ. And, and one of the things I've even said, uh, I brought from another pastor is the easiest way, the easiest form of evangelism, I'm not saying it's the best way, uh, clearly not the only way, but the easiest way of evangelism is come and see. That's what Andrew did in John chapter one to his brother, Peter. He says, hey, come with me and see. I think we found the That's Messiah. Right. And one of the things you can do if you've got a, you've got a church and a pastor that, that teaches the gospel each week and preaches the gospel is if, if you don't feel like you're as equipped as you want to be to share the gospel, you can go up to a friend or family member or neighbor and say, hey, come with me and see. Come with me and listen to what my pastor has to say, because I think it's a message that changed my life, and I believe it's a message that can change your life. And now, again, is that you doing a full gospel presentation to them? No, but you're saying, I want you to be in an atmosphere where you can act. And then hopefully you'll become, as an individual, a congregant, you'll become more comfortable sharing your faith later on. But the best church, the fastest growing churches and, and, the, most, and the healthiest churches that grow are because people that are inviting friends to be a part of something where they've either shared the gospel with them already, or they're saying, Hey, come with me and uh, c come here. What's being, what's being taught here. And cause it's a life changing message. 
And so I think, I think we all got to do a better job of that. Pastors uh, got to do a better job of teaching it. And then as we teach it, uh, congregants got to do a better job of implementing it. That is a great answer. Thank you so much. So um, I don't know what else you want to share, but I have a ton of, ton of things. And I, I don't know how your schedule looks like. But so assuming someone, uh, you've spoken to a person and they've actually responded to the Revelations 3.20 um, maybe I can read that just a little bit um, over here, uh, but I'm sure you know what that one is. I don't want to. Okay, maybe I can read. I stand at the door and knock. Yeah, if anyone hears right. my voice. Correct. So, yeah. assuming the person that you're talking to has opened up their hearts and they want to receive Christ as their Savior, what are the next steps? I think maybe that's when the discipleship comes in, because I think if you just do the evangelism. Um, and probably don't direct them to a Bible-believing church, somewhere that they can get discipled, I feel that they're going to fall through the cracks because they're baby Christians. And um, that, that is not a good place to be. So after they've received Christ, what are the, some of the you know, important steps that, um, assuming I, I, I engaged in someone, what are some of the things I need to make sure that they are stabilized or they're in their home church and they're growing spiritually? Yeah, and that's a great question. It's a great issue because, unfortunately, we have too many people who are making professions of faith, and because they're not being discipled, uh, some of that time that faith is not real. Sometimes that faith, so a, a conversion can happen all at once, or it can be a process. Mm. Um, and sometimes, as Jesus said in the parable of the soil, there's different types of soil. There's the road, there's the hard rock, right. uh, there's, uh, you know, there's thorns and thistles, and then there's soft, good soil. And the thorns and thistles, that one appears to have joy, starts to grow. And then the thorns and thistles, the cares of the world, choke it out. The deception okay. of Satan choke it out. And it really isn't, it really isn't uh, good soil. So it's not really a believer. Um, and so one of the things we have to do when someone professes Christ is we got to disciple them to make sure that they're continuing in that process. And uh, there's a lot of different first steps you can encourage. Uh, there's a, a few I talk about. One is... Um, yes, being a, being a part of a, of a, of a church and of a, even of a small group, whether you call that Bible study or home group or Sunday school or whatever you call that, uh, to be a part of a small group where you can grow with a few people. Uh -huh. uh, people tend to learn more and ask more questions and get questions answered when, when they're in a small group. I talked to them in, in my faith tradition, baptism comes after belief. And so I talked about professing their faith through baptism. That's what we see in the New Testament. Um, but there's also... Uh, there's also books designed, short study books designed. There's one called Growing in Christ that I like to okay. use. I think uh, the navigators came up with it. Okay. It's a 13-lesson plan. Uh, you can do one lesson a week and divide it up over a few days and do that lesson. Or you can, you know, if you were real uh, gung-ho, you can maybe cover two or three lessons in a week. But what I would say then, and I get with someone, when I pass that book off, I say, I think this is going to help you grow as a Christian and understand the basic truths of God's word. Uh, let's get together, and I meet with them either every week or every other week to see what questions they have and see how they're making their way through it and see if they're getting the answers right. right. They've looked up in Scripture and written down in the book. And that, and, and not just that book, but there's books like that to help Christians grow. And uh, a survival kit, I think, is another one uh, that, that can be helpful. So there's just a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of good resources out there. We just got to take advantage of them because too many people find out someone trusts Jesus. They say, praise the Lord, and then they turn their attention elsewhere. And forget to disciple that, and, and we're called to do that too. That's that, that's great. Now, my personal challenge, and I'm hoping that you'll be able to advise me. My personal challenge, and I'm sure somebody else is probably going through the same um, phase, is sharing the gospel with someone who believes in another in a religion. Um, I, I just don't want to mention yeah. the names, but a typical one can be a Muslim. How do you, whatever you say, they point to God, but of course they think Jesus Christ is someone else, and how do you overcome that? How, how do you break those barriers? And what can you do apart from prayer, um, obviously? Yeah, and that's a great question. And it's one that uh, I've run into many people of different faiths, both cults and world religions. That's right. Uh, who really need it. And what I found, and this is both through um, some personal experience as well as what I read from others that, that write on these things, uh, the most effective form of evangelism today is what's called intentional relational evangelism. And what I mean by that is the relational aspect, you already have a relationship with that person. It's a family member, a friend, a neighbor, a coworker, a classmate, something like that, that you've already 
you already know them. They already know you. It's not like you start talking to them. It's the very first time you've already got a relationship okay. with them. But the intentional part is you intentionally seek to share the gospel with them. And uh, it's one thing if you just know somebody and you're just, hey, how's it going? But you never tell them about Jesus. Well, you're not being a true friend to them. So you have to be an intentional, relational kind of evangelist. And when you meet people of different faiths, if you will befriend them first mm. and they begin to trust you, you help them out. You know, if they got if they're next door neighbor and they've got issues at their house or they're something's gone wrong and you can pitch a hand and say, hey, can I give you a hand to help fix that? Or can I give you uh -huh. a hand to help move that? Or you find out they've lost a loved one and you just take them some food and say, hey, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm praying for you. I mean, little things that show that you care about them or it's a coworker or something along those lines. Then they begin to open up and realize, okay, this person does care about me. Uh -huh. and then you may find a little bit about their beliefs. So you might want to study a Christian perspective of Islam or whatever you might be dealing with and uh, learn a little bit about them, about their faith before you start talking to them about Jesus, because they may throw some red flags up or some barriers up. But if they know you care about them deeply, mm. uh, in the long run, they'll be more willing to listen to you. And they may still reject. They may be deep in the trenches of their particular faith, and they may still reject. But if they know you care, they'll typically give you a listening ear. And again, that you're, we're called to plant seeds. And so if we can help Grant get that list, we never know what God's going to do in that person's life. That's I'm right. sure no one thought Saul, who we know Paul, no one thought in his day that he was actually going to become a Christian and Jesus got a hold of his life. So God can do great things if we just pray for people, be, befriend them, and then uh, begin to plant seeds of, of the good news. That's excellent. Thank you for that reassuring answer. Um, I just have one more question. And then... We will okay. be good to go. Um, so you meet someone and they, they, they've had a bad experience. Um, they were in the faith and probably have left um, because mm. maybe a church member hurt them or a pastor or the pastor's wife or somebody hurt them so yep. bad they left the faith. What, what can we do at that, at that, at that, at that stage? What, what, what can we do? I, I'm just lost for words. Yeah, and unfortunately, that happens far too many times. Yes. Um, the, the church is supposed to be a an encouraging, uh, loving kind of people. Uh, we're all sinners. We're sinners saved by God's grace. And sometimes as sinners, we come across as hurtful and uh, mean-spirited, yeah. bitter, and, and can push people away. Instead of drawing them into the fold, we can push people away. If we've ever done that, we need to recognize, hey, if I, if I did something to drive this person off, we need to go to them and let them know, hey, I, let me apologize if there's anything I've done. And, and maybe they'll share, hey, yeah, you did something you did and you did this. And you didn't even realize you did that kind of thing. But we all be willing to reach out to them, kind of like the person that needs Jesus outside the faith, befriend them. you got to befriend them to hopefully uh, extend the, the grace and love of Jesus so that they would come back. And if they're not, maybe they're so hurt and they just cannot worship at your church any longer. I know, um, I, I know a lady in a church I served whose two kids uh, grew up, went to actually went to Liberty University. Both of them did, but this was like uh, six or eight hundred miles from home. And they went off, and they were both gone. And, and once they went to Liberty, they they met other uh, significant others, and they started relationships and got married and so forth. And when the lady came back to our church, uh, the, the, the mother, all she could think about was, was her kids growing up in that church. And all she would do is cry every time she came there to worship because it reminded her, that place reminded her of her kids growing up in the faith. And she was thankful for what God was doing, but she missed them so deeply because they were hundreds of miles away now. And so she said, you know, I just can't keep coming there. I said, you know what, if that's the case, you know, I don't doubt your commitment to Christ. Find, find a church home. And sometimes I'd recommend other churches in the area. They find a church home you can worship at, you can grow in the Lord. Uh, and, and, and so sometimes people, if, they, if they've been hurt so bad and they just can't step foot back in that church, maybe the pastor's hurt them. Maybe it's the pastor's wife. Maybe it's another key person in the, in the church family. But if you can go and say, listen, you really need to be growing in the Lord. Let me recommend another church down the road. Let, and hopefully you've got some pastor friends in the area where you can do that, that kind of thing. And that ultimately is going to help them in the long run because you're more concerned or you should be more concerned from a kingdom perspective that they keep growing in the Lord and serving the Lord. You prefer that to be at your church because you want to help disciple them. But if not, point them into somewhere else. And, and hopefully God's spirit would be at work in their life to 
cause them to get reengaged with the body of believers? Because that's obviously very important in the Christian life. That's right. Well, thank you so much. And I just want you to share a word of prayer with us, um, just that we, so that we can get encouraged and be confident in doing the work of an evangelist. Um, and, and I pray that the people that are listening will be encouraged that it's not you. And so long as you do it, you know, faithfully, like you said, then whatever seed you're planting is not a failure. You're actually successful in doing the work of an evangelist. But I just want you to share a word of prayer with us so that as we get off this stream, um, at least for the rest of the day, we have a mission in mind, not just for today, but for the rest of our lives as Christians, that we are going to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and we're going to do it without fear. The, the main thing is to right. share it. Let it come out of your heart. The, you know, you, you love someone or you want someone to be saved. Um, just boldly share it. Um, whether they accept Christ or not, you have done your duty. Um, so if you could pray with us <laughs> so that we are encouraged with a spirit of excellence and spirit of boldness and of faith, and we can just go out there and preach Jesus Christ. Because I believe that's the existence. That's the reason why the church exists is to share the good news and, event, you know, disciple people as well. So please go ahead and uh, share a word of prayer with us, and uh, we can call it a day. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah, let's pray thank together. You. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I give you thanks for life in Christ, for knowing Jesus and being known by Jesus, for uh, being a part of his family, and for the faithfulness of others, like my parents and pastors and others, who were so faithful to share the good news of the hope of Jesus and forgiveness of sins found in him uh, in my life all those years ago. And it transformed my life. And I thank you for uh, each one that's watched here and that can claim to be a follower of Jesus, uh, how you save them. Lord, help us. Uh, I thank you for Abina and for this whole desire. She's wanted to get more people equipped into sharing their faith. Uh, help us as we do that very thing, not only as we share the faith and we talk about the grace of, of God found in Jesus, uh, but we also encourage others to do that. And we help train them and equip them so that we can have a, a bigger army of your servants going out and spreading the hope that's found only in Jesus. So encourage us today. Help us have a, a mindset of a missionary everywhere we go to see people that need you. And uh, give us courage and boldness and uh, let us share Christ without fear as we talk to people and uh, find out where they're at and encourage them to direct their lives toward Jesus. We give you thanks for the life you've given us. Help us, Lord, as we serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you so much. My regards to your family. All right. really awesome God bless you, Abina. Thank you so much. Thank you. Talk Thank to you again soon. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.